As I said, uh, we are very happy to have you all here. We are uh, in during the Open Education Week in 2022, and uh, we have a series of webinars the whole week organized by Eden. And uh, uh, today uh, we are going to have a very nice uh, discussion uh, about uh, digital experience in technical higher education. Uh, in the meantime, I see we also have people from Sweden and Austria, welcome. Uh, in uh, these times, we believe that the unity of higher education in Europe uh, has been seen and uh, we all want to focus on doing our parts in uh, shaping the minds of young people uh, because through education uh, we can uh, conquer far more than through other uh, means uh, which uh, are not, uh, not so good. So, as I said, uh, we are here uh, to talk about the digital experience in technical higher education. Uh, in the past two years, everyone transitioned to online learning and uh, the specialists and professionals from technical higher education, technical uh, universities were already prepared. Uh, they had good experiences. You will see uh, them, uh, some of these professionals sharing these experiences today. And uh, because even after the pandemic time, we are sure digital technologies in education will remain uh, in, uh, in use, we think that this type of topic is very useful uh, for us. I'm going to introduce now uh, uh, first myself. I am Vlad Mihaescu. I am coming from the Polytechnica University of Timisoara. I am the Eden Network of Ad Academics and Professional uh, Steering Committee Chair. Uh, the Eden Network of Academics and Professionals is organizing this webinar uh, during this week, and we are building uh, the community of professionals inside the, inside the Eden uh, larger community. Uh, the first speaker, which I'm going to uh, introduce, and it gives me a very um, a big pleasure to do this, uh, is uh, a very a close mentor and collaborator of mine for the past more than 10 years. Uh, it's, uh, I'm talking about uh, Diana Andone. Uh, if you have been involved already in Eden activities, you probably know Diana. Uh, she has been involved with Eden uh, for a very, very long time. She is currently uh, in the uh, Fellow of Co Council of Fellows board. Uh, Diana is coming from uh, the Polytechnic University of Timisoara where she is the director of the e-learning center and she's uh, deeply involved in uh, strategies uh, for uh, digital technologies and uh, online education, not only in the university, but uh, I would say in, uh, in the whole uh, city and uh, region. Also, she uh, is a, a member of uh, IEEE and uh, uh, last year she uh, was a distinguished uh, uh, with uh, the Education Society Chapter Leadership Award. Finally, Diana is also a senior fellow of Eden, and uh, it gives me, as I said, a very big pleasure to uh, hear what she has to present. Diana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for this. Let me start sharing my screen. So we go directly in presentation mode. Please let me know that everything is right. Perfect. Good, good, perfect. So I'm going to speak about digital experiences in technical higher education with a focus on the activities which we are doing now in the Polytechnic University of Timisoara. And thank you very much, Vlad, for uh, your nice and kind words. A lot of these things which I'm going to present here, Vlad is also deeply involved in uh, creating and producing them. So it's a, we can say it's a joint presentation in, in this kind. And in one moment, uh, some of the projects in which we are doing is also involving two other of the co-presenters from today. So um, from where everything started, uh, back 12 years ago, we came up with this idea how we are building up the digital education of the university. And this I presented several times. I'm not going to focus too much on that, just to give, give you the framework. So that's the framework in which we are developing and we are doing this now. How you build it up, uh, obviously based on a vision, 
structuring and policies, but mainly on community and then on the validation because you need people uh, to be able to build it up and also you need to check what you're doing. So benchmarking analysis is part of everything what you need to do if you really want to be able to build up digital education. And us in the technical universities, we are focusing quite a lot on that. Back in about seven years ago, we started this idea how really we can build up the open lifelong learning students. This came up somehow uh, from the past, from the mid-2000, uh, when I was doing my PhD and I was focusing on the digital students. So I came up with some new ideas and uh, we tried to build up this based on open online learning. Uh, basically introducing and using a lot of MOOCs in our traditional higher education. And I'm going to speak also about a project which is also doing that. I'm focusing obviously on virtual campus, on production of open educational resources, and also on involving students as co-creators. Uh, on virtual mobilities, we're starting doing this since 2008. And more recently on micro-credentialing, um, also small courses, small webinars, or the training, continuous professional development, and so on. So what I'm going to speak now is a tiny bit of this, which is the digital transformation. And mainly I will focus on the competencies and on the community part of it. And I will not focus only for the academic staff, also for non-academic staff, for students, and also uh, how you involve the external stakeholders in this. So these are the ideas which I'm going to present today. I will come back to this later. I just want to, to have it here also as a roundup of this. So I will go further to all of them. First, how you focus on training, uh, because that's the first bit which you will need to do to create this com community and these competencies of all your stakeholders. Obviously, the first bit is continuous professional development. You do that through training, through tutorials, uh, through um, constant um, support, and also through a lot of uh, nowadays webinars in the past, also face-to-face, -face, uh, how to say, uh, training sessions. So you need to have that schedule and program, and not only for the academic staff, also for the students, also when they are the first year, but also when they are the final year, so continuous. It doesn't mean in what stage of their development there. You still need to have a sort of training and support for that. For that, you build the digital education competencies and you need to focus quite a lot on the new digital pedagogies. This is, for example, a graph uh, which is one year old now. We are still producing the other graph which will show the last two years, which just shows how many of those resources were developed only in one year in our universities. And I will just try to figure out about this. 20,000 new interactive resources were produced by our staff and students. And uh, for all of those, uh, we thank them a lot. So uh, the other bit is building up open online learning and creating that sort of uh, environment where the community really can be developed. Because once, one is the level of the training which you give inside the university, and one is how you involve also the outside stakeholders into your courses and to validate them also externally. So for that, we built up uh, back in 2016, the Unicampus platform where also Vlad was uh, deeply involved. In fact, it was his PhD thesis. So how we have done this uh, in with digital transformation and building up and strongly the community is we had a lot of webinars uh, together online. We ran 30 webinars last year and now we are uh, running the webinars of sharing together uh, where we had thousands of participants. We had last year more than 10,000 10, participants, um, around 150 presenters and a lot of partner institutions involved. So that's how you create a community and how you validate the things which you are doing. Obviously, we introduce uh, microcredits also for this type of informal learning, which are not really uh, training, but it's more to create that sense of uh, being part of a transformative community and validating the knowledges which you have, which were uh, done for the webinars. Students as uh, co-creators, I kept mentioning that a lot. Once you start involving the students as co-creators, and especially once you start 
showing them how to create open educational resources that will really enhance the quality of your education, the quality of the delivery, but mainly it will motivate your students to do a tiny bit more, to go that extra mile where they can really do uh, different things, where they can really uh, engage themselves into the educational process and where they also are able to reflect on what they they are doing or learning, right? And what they can still improve uh, by themselves. Now, something about uh, the support and the training and how you built up this uh, webinars and consultation and online uh, support which you need to have and how you build these new digital pedagogies. And here it comes uh, the Mode IT project in which also Dina is involved, the Kaunas University of Technologies, one of the partners together with the other technical universities, including University of Porto, and it's a project run by Fachhochschule de Mittelstand. Uh, what we have done in Mode IT, we try to focus on how you are using open online learning, especially MOOC techniques and pedagogies in higher education, especially in technical higher education, how you can improve based on that. So what we have done, we developed uh, an online self-assessment tool, so you know first where you are and what you need to do. Then we built up the open online training program. Then we are now already having several courses, I think 14 different courses in all of our universities uh, where the curricula and the content and materials were redesigned based on this MOOC learning and MOOC pedagogies. And now we are in the phase of pilot, the final pilot effect and the evaluation. So something about the Mode IT online training program, uh, this is uh, supported by the KTU uh, platform at this moment. And these are the five learning modules on foundation, on MOOC course design, MOOC content production, how you deliver MOOCs, and obviously how you build up MOOCs in formal learning, and as I said, in the traditional higher education. At this moment, the courses are on KTU, but soon they are going to be on Iversity, and we are going to share that information when it's going to be available. Um, at this moment, as I said, we have 20 professors and courses which are adapted and changed in the different universities. And what it came out as a, as a major, how to say, outcome of this project, or at least for our university, is that uh, a lot of professors have developed the, the new skills uh, for where they can implement even the tiny bit of changes. Like until now, they will put some OR, some resources, online on the university virtual campus, and they will encourage the students to use them. Now, they are really creating activities around those resources, and that's probably the biggest uh, shift in their uh, skills and mentality on how to deliver the, the courses, especially when you are looking at the open techniques, uh, open education techniques. The other one is mentoring. We strongly believe in mentors and in role models and in best practices. If you remember from the first slide where I put the UPT, uh, the, our university digital education, I strongly uh, emphasize that you need to create obviously a community and that you start from the early adopters and then you have the, those which are the trailblazers and then you really need the digital education ambassadors. And for that, you need role models and mentors and you need to encourage that. So from these uh, ideas came up uh, this uh, augmented teaching through blended learning Erasmus Plus project, which we are calling Akadija, where we are really trying to build up more and focus more on this mentorship for digital education. These are the partners, again, uh, co-speakers in this uh, presentation coming from University of, uh, of Porto. Obviously, a lot of technical universities is again focusing for the technical higher education on how to do that. What we are doing this is obviously, we are that's the end goal to try to accelerate the digital readiness of the technical higher education institutes, institutes with this new profile of the educators. And for this, uh, we are really looking further for training the mentors and then bringing Akadija to life, which will mean at least 100 uh, trainees, which are going to be mentored by the, the mentors in all the partner universities. So something about that, uh, we have done already a kit, which is um, 
an analyze also at national level and then building up at international level that analyze how we are going to reinvent the role of the academics in, uh, in the digital education uh, universities and how you do that uh, grasping obviously the use of the most uh, recent open pedagogical tools. Uh, the tools which we analyze uh, because the, we focus on the pedagogical tools and also, uh, sorry, on the pedagogical methods and then also on the pedagogical tools. These are the tools which we analyze and we identify that they, we need more supported training, which can be used for different levels of the education system. And uh, we have built up now and we are trying to finalize as soon as going to be public, the mentors training course and the handbook, uh, which is the course is going to be delivered from May. And then we are going to have uh, for establishing these mentors and then in each university. And then we are going to have the trainees uh, involved uh, starting with the new academic year of 2000 and 2023. Uh, so um, how we are looking at what we are looking in this uh, training course and the handbook at the soft and transversal skills and how you are building up also for the mentors, but also for the trainees on the digital education skills and also what are the methods on which you can give support and mentoring uh, for the, everybody. We built, there are two frameworks which we are taking into consideration for this. One is obviously the DIC Comp uh, Edu, which uh, the digital competence framework for educators developed by the European Union, which in fact are, is going to give us the framework and the validity also for the certificates and the open badges, which the mentors and the trainees are going to gain at the end of this, uh, of this project. And also on the ABC to Vili uh, Erasmus Plus project, but mainly on the ABC learning design, where you, are, where you are looking at the different tools and support and also pedagogical models for acquisition, collaboration, discussion, investigation, practice, and production. So for each of them, we will identify the tools, best practices, and also how uh, you can go to implement them through uh, mentors, so through one-to-one -one delivery, not through large training programs. That's the difference in which we have now for the mentorship project, which we believe that those role models really can change a bit more than just simple training courses. The mentor course, as I said, is built up on this uh, educator-specific digital competencies, and it looks at professional engagement, as I said, digital resources, teaching and learning, also assessment, empowering the learners and facilitating the learner digital competencies. And we hope we are going to improve <laughs> the emotional intelligence also of the educators, the mentoring skills, but also the personal competencies. This is the mentor profile uh, as we are looking at and how we are building it up. And as you say, the largest uh, things are basically those which we consider more important and what we are going to look and encourage the, the mentors to be. So now towards the end, that's how you built up the, in our opinion, at least, the competencies and the communities around digital transformation. I only gave you three examples, one uh, with co-creators and also with deep involvement and training and webinars for everybody, then how you use MOOCs in the traditional higher education and how you built up mentors. Uh, besides another extra level based on the training and the continuous professional development. So basically, based on this, you really can find solutions which will bring even further. So we are now almost closing the pandemics, but we will still need to have a huge focus of the digital education. And these are the lessons which we have learned especially from the last two years and which we already tested. So we know that they are going to work and hopefully they are going to last and the professors and the students are going to use them and they are going to be really implemented into the future and will validate even further the, the importance of the digitalness into the higher education. And this is obviously quite strongly in, in the view, as I said, with our university uh, digital education strategy, 
but also with the Digital Education Action Plan developed by the European Union and soon to be launched the Digital Education Hub, which is exactly focusing on the community's aspect. That's the team which is making everything uh, possible. You can also see Vlad there. So he's, as I said, he was also deeply involved in this. And uh, if you have further ideas and further things, please uh, let me know. And please uh, ask questions in the Q&A and I'll be happy to answer. And I don't know if I need to say this now, Vlad, or you are going to say it at the end. Please do if it's up the screen. Okay, uh, I'm encouraging you <laughs> to come to the Eden Annual Conference in Tallinn. We are hoping we are going to meet face to face again for two years. The first online conference was in Timisara in 2020. Then in 2021, we gone again virtually to Madrid. Let's hope that Tallinn is going to join us together. So we are really looking again at the same thing on how we shape the digital transformation of the education ecosystem in Timshara. And obviously we are living very difficult times nowadays. And I think we really need to support uh, all uh, the academics. Uh, all of us, we are doing a tiny bit of work to try to support the universities, especially those which are university professors and students which are now refugees uh, coming to Romania and all of the neighboring countries and try to give them as much as possible support and integration after that so they, they can still have a sort of normal life, even, uh, how to say, after all the distress they, they faced uh, uh, recently. Thank you very much for this. And uh, thanks a lot Thank for this. Thank you, uh, Diana. Very interesting uh, presentation and uh, strong, uh, strong finish with the message. Um, I uh, I saw an interesting question in the Q and A, and uh, maybe we can try a, a quick answer now. It's a question from uh, Alistair. Uh, choosing tools that comply with RAMs and GDPR is rather difficult, as most of them store data outside the EU. Did you find any tools which are safe in this respect? Uh, yes, uh, one of the things which we looked at, a lot of the tools which, uh, for example, I showed you, that um, a lot of them are nowadays having this sort of uh, interface that you can really install on your own university servers. Uh, I'm not saying about Moodle, MoodleNet, and also, for example, Skype, you can install it, or also communicate open online uh, forums and so on, which you can put on your uh, university networks. Also, the other ones like Kahoot and Kaltura, you also can install. So a lot of them have in the GitHub or uh, even on their own website, further developments which allow you to put it on the university server. So that will completely cut out the non-EU uh, interface. Obviously, what's the pitfall for that? You need staff who knows what they are doing and who knows how to support and what, uh, what they need to do. And you need also the technical development to, to be able to do that. So it's not an easy path if you really want to stay independent and, and open. And probably that's the, the biggest problem which openness uh, faces at this moment. That, you need staff, uh, very well-trained staff. You need technical development support because the possibilities are there, but they're not that easy. The easiest solution is always to go online and use the things which already exist. So I don't have a perfect solution. I only have ideas. Thank you. I, I hope uh, it, this will satisfy at least partially Alistair and his question. I encourage everyone to continue asking questions in the Q&A uh, section. Um, thank you, Diana. We will come back to you um, in the end of the session for the Q&A part. Thank you. I will move now to the second speaker uh, of the day, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, present uh, Gustavo Alves. He's coming from Polytechnic of Porto, and uh, he, uh, is a he teaches there, and also he is the head of the Center for Innovation in Engineering and Industrial Technology. Uh, also, he has uh, hundreds of uh, publications uh, related to um, education, engineering, uh, and uh, uh, remote laboratories as well. And uh, I, I want to say that he's also involved in IEEE, like uh, Diana. He is uh, uh, IEEE Latin American Learning Technologies uh, Journal uh, AE. 
I am very happy, as I said, to introduce Gustavo. Gustavo, please, I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, it's a pleasure. And uh, above all, thank you for the, the opportunity to, well, speak with you about what is my research interest, interest about remote and virtual apps. So I'll try to share my screen right now. Okay. And let me put my presentation. Is it okay? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. So the whole idea, and this was the reason for the invitation, I want to share with you some knowledge and uh, ideas about using remote and virtual apps in technical higher education. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm from the Polytechnic of Porto School of Engineering. It's this uh, red dot that you can see there on the globe. It's really on the, on the very end of Europe on the Western part. Uh, and uh, the outline for my presentation is this one. It's very simple, five points. I want to make a distinction about hands-on, remote and virtual apps. Okay, so it's, uh, so that it's clear to everybody. Then I will talk about trends in engineering education. Then I will go to the fundamental objectives of engineering instruction laboratories. Why do we use laboratories in engineering education? And then I will go to remote and virtual apps as teaching and learning environments. Why can, how can we use these new uh, types of, uh, of labs in engineering education? And I will give an example and try to involve you in this example, okay? So this whole idea about uh, uh, remote and virtual labs comes from two criteria that were proposed by Sebastian Dormido. So if you distinguish remote from local and real from virtual, you end up with a classification in four different items. So real uh, local labs are what we call hands-on lab. You have to go to the lab, you have to enter a room, and we have the equipment there. So everything is real, but you need to go there. If you move to the remote part, then you have remote labs. That means that you are accessing real equipment from your computer, your smartphone, okay? You have real equipment, you have real responses from nature. The only idea is that you have computer-mediated access to that equipment. If you move to the simulation part, you can have two part, two hypotheses. Either you need to go to a lab because the software is installed there, and you call this a simulation, okay? Or you can access that simulation through your computer or smartphone, and then you call it a virtual lab, okay? So two simple criteria, real remote, local, re uh, sorry, real simulated, remote, local, and if you combine, you have this distinction. Now talking about trends in engineering education, I'll give you three very simple documents. One from Freud, Wankant and Smith that was written in 2011 and 2012, where they analyzed 100 years of papers, uh, articles about engineering education. So this was in the Sentinel uh, proceedings of the, the IEEE. The other one is a, a report, an EMC report 2011, 17, I, I will explain why I went to 2017. And then this uh, Global State of the Art in Engineering Education report that was written by Ruth Schramm in 2018. If you go to this first uh, document, the five major shifts in 100 years of engineering education are a year. And the last one is a shift to integrating information, computational and communications technologies in education. And if you go to this specific shift, you will see that there are several movements in this shift. One of them is the content deliverable, first through so television, videotape, and then through so the internet. So you can see here how Eden is referred here as one of the, the components in this shift. But you can also see simulations and remote laboratories here. Okay, 
So they are part of this shift of integrating ICT in engineering education. If you look into the NMSC Horizon report in 2017, so this is about five years ago, you will see different trends, challenges, and developments. And you will see that one of the developments is to adaptive technology, learning technologies and using remote and virtual laboratories. It is really the last sentence here. And you see that they were predicting the, the time to adoption horizon was one year or less. And we were in 2070, so we are actually five years away from that. But one thing is predicting, like simulating, the other thing is the reality. So actually, COVID did it better. More than anything else, COVID was a driving force to the adoption of virtual and remote labs to digitalization, et cetera. Okay, and nobody was predicting COVID. So many institutions are actually now using remote and virtual labs as part of emergency educational responses. So we had to adapt very fast. And we, we have seen this in the, the previous presentation of Diana, okay? The other paper that I was referring to is the fundamental objectives of engineering instruction laboratories. What do engineering, engineering students go to the lab to, why do they go there? Why do we use labs? And it basically, um, Faisal and Rosa proposed a, a set of 13 fundamental objectives. They are listed on the paper. And I give you just two examples. Instrumentation. We go to the lab because we need to understand how to use instruments, how to make measurements, okay? How to measure physical quantities. The other reason why we go to a lab is that because we have models in our head, a lot, for instance, the, the law of gravity, you let something and it, drop something, it will be attracted to another mass, that is the mass of the Earth, et cetera, Ohm's law. So we have these conceptual models in our mind, and we need to make experiments to make sure that these models are accurate, they work, okay? So the other thing is models. Identify the strengths and the limitations of stereotypical models as predictors of real-world behaviors. And there are more 11 fundamental objectives. So if you combine these three different types of, of uh, in lab laboratories, and you understand that in the middle, the student has to make some calculus when moving from a remote to a virtual to a hands-on, you will see that the, 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 the competencies of the teachers have to increase quite much. A teacher is a, a central point on this because he has to propose learning tasks. He has to help the, the guide the students through these different environments so that students acquire experimental competence, so that students learn more. And they learn more by doing experiments, okay? So the whole idea is to facilitate doing experiments. And that's crucial in the engineering education. You have a number of papers here that give you an idea the tri-lab, uh, the impact of remote and virtual access to hardware upon the learning outcomes, uh, et cetera. So how is the world in this re to this respect? We, we can see here some examples, okay? Remote labs that you can use for free in Brazil, a company that is uh, uh, placed in, 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 in Spain, Labsland, you have also this huge European project called GoLab, where you also have a, a number of educational resources based on simulations and remote labs that you can use. And you have this national project in India that gathers all the India, almost all the Indian institutes of technology called Virtual Labs. So we have a, a number of examples and resources that you can know and use. So what I'm going to do now is uh, give you an example of one particular remote lab called VIZIR. VIZIR stands for Virtual Instrument Systems in Reality. 
It was developed by Professor Iqbal Gustafsson, who passed away in 2017. And he had this vision that was inspired in Max Planck, that an experiment is a conversation with nature. When you make an experiment, you are making a question to nature. And you, when you do a measurement, you are recording the response of nature. So every measurement is a recording of the answer of nature. And you can do this in a real lab, hands-on, or you can do this in a remote lab. And that was his, his motivation for developing Vizir. So basically Vizir, that is here in this image, is a, um, a remote lab where you have a multimeter, a functional generator, uh, an oscilloscope, um, and you have a DC power supply, and you have a breadboard where you can actually mount real circuits with real components. So you can see on this different image that the breadboard, it's a, a digital representation of a real matrix where you have the components inserted there. So when you mount a circuit on your computer, this circuit will be mounted on a, 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 a real uh, matrix that is placed in Porto, in, uh, in Sweden, wherever, okay? But you, real, you need access to real equipments. You can see here the different implementations of Vizir. So when you do a real experiment in Vizir, this can be done in Costa Rica, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Australia, in Spain, in Sweden, in Austria. So wherever there is a, a VZ laboratory, an experiment is being made there. So the whole idea is that when you engage in a, a certain class with a student, okay, maybe you want to show the difference between a simulation, a real experimentation, et cetera. So the whole idea is that now we can, let me make an experiment with you. So this is the real lab. You can see the remote lab, sorry. You can see here that I have mounted a simple circuit. If you look into this, you will see wires and a resistor and a diode there. So there are images of real components. But to give you a conceptual overview, I will go to the virtual lab and I will actually share this with you. So I will export this uh, experiment. I will put this on the chat window so everybody can follow the experiment with me. Okay, if you go to the chat window and if you click on that, you should have this experiment. Okay, Vlad, are you following? Do you see the my experiment? Do you have it on your computer? Yes, I'm looking okay. at it. Good. So now I can do experiments with everybody. Okay, I can ask questions. For instance, you can see here, if I put my, my mouse in, on top of the, the function generator, you see that the, the waveform will turn into blue. So that's the waveform that we are seeing now. And uh, if we put on top of my resistor, you will see that this is the waveform present of my resistor that is controlled by actually this diode here that I'm not seeing. So here I can stop the time. This is really nice with virtual labs. You can do this in, in, in a simulation. In reality, you cannot stop time, yeah? So there's a difference between a simulation and a real experiment. And the, the trick is that this, the teacher knows these differences and can take the, the, the potentiality or the, the advantage of one lab environment and explain something to the student. Or if he wants to detail something about the real response of a, a diet, he can go to the remote labs. So the whole idea is the professor is the main center of this because it will interact with the students according to the doubts that the student has, according to the lecture he wants to give, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and I'm doing everything here using just my computer. 
a simulation, or I can go to the remote lab. I can go, for instance, here, and let me, instead of putting a, a sine wave, let me put a, a, a triangular wave. Let me go to the oscilloscope. You can see here the, the response with the, 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 the sine wave. And when I do perform experiment, I'll see this, the change here. You can see the detail that the, 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 the waveform on the raster is decoupled from the one because there's a, a, a voltage drop on the, on the diode. We can explain this why, et cetera, et cetera. And we can go to our remote, to our virtual lab. And instead of uh, a waveform like this, let me put a triangle, apply, okay. And we can see the difference here, okay? And if we do stop and we use the cursor, we'll see actually that there is a, a small difference here. When it is zero on the, on the one, it's not, it has not initiated the, the voltage on the, 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 the resistor. And the whole idea is that students can actually follow my experiment or they can try on their own. For instance, right now, you or Vlad can be using the, re, the virtual experiment and be trying other things. And they can pass this to me and I can see what they are doing because you can actually generate an instant URL, an instant address that will give me the status of his experiment. And that's it. So basically what I wanted to share with you is that this whole idea of doing experiments has been improved because you can have hands-on, remote labs, and virtual labs. And the main part here is training the teacher to be able to actually use all these resources to help the student learn more and do more experiments. So I'll go back to my presentation. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Gustavo. This was uh, very interesting and uh, interactive. Uh, I enjoyed uh, very much the, this virtual lab uh, uh, which you offered. It remind me, me, reminded me of my years in the Faculty of uh, Electronics and Telecommunication. <laughs> It is something I have seen at some point there. <laughs> so uh, I didn't see any questions in the Q&A section. I encourage uh, our participants to put their questions there. Uh, I am sure that all the information uh, uh, and the links and the material will be uh, very useful for our participants. The presentations will be uh, uploaded on, uh, on Eden's platforms. So, Gustavo, thank you. We will come back to you uh, in, in the end for the Q&A section. Thank you, Vlad, and thank you, everybody. Now we move to uh, another one of my collaborators uh, in, uh, in projects. Um, uh, this time, uh, I'm happy to uh, introduce Daina Gudonien, Associate Professor at Kaunas University of Technology, uh, Faculty of Informatics from Lithuania. Uh, she uh, leads a group of researchers uh, called Smart Educational Technologies and Applications. Uh, she is involved in uh, many projects, uh, wrote a lot of publications related uh, um, on the topics of uh, digital technologies in education, micro-credentials, uh, and uh, also AI. And uh, she's also involved with the European Consortium of Innovative Universities. I am very looking forward to hearing about AI in education from Daina. So Daina, please, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, uh, Vlad, for introduction. It's my pleasure to share with all of you uh, with experience uh, here at Kaunas University of Technology. I hope you see my screen well and I will uh, start my presentation on artificial intelligence in education. Uh, we developed together with uh, Professor Thomas Blaszowskis. And uh, as uh, Vlad presented, um, I am a research teacher at uh, informatics faculty, and my research area is smart educational technologies and applications. 
so uh, here I will present uh, more um, what allows artificial intelligence about personalized learning by using smart content on um, your phone whenever you need it the most due to the adaptive learning technology and about artificial intelligence allowing and supporting or assisting online when teachers are working with large uh, groups of students or during remote uh, or hybrid learning, what was the big request during the pandemic. Uh, so my presentation is on technologies and opportunities of artificial intelligence in the education and artificial uh, intelligent for learning, learning assessment and practical examples of artificial intelligence based support in the teaching processes. And um, uh, as defined by Carter, artificial intelligent education applications are systems that analyze large amount of data beyond simple algorithms. Uh, these applications are uh, trained to identify and classify patterns, make predictions and suggestions based on probability and operate without supervision. And my presentation is more related to the chatbots in education that allow the support or assistance online when teachers have to ensure quality of learning processes when uh, working with a large number of students at once. So, uh, of course, there are um, many opportunities for educational environment participants related to artificial uh, intelligence. However, um, main opportunities are related to uh, education management and delivery, empowering teaching and teachers, learning and learning assessment, development of values and skills for life and work in artificial intelligence era. Uh, offering lifelong learning opportunities for all and artificial intelligence for learning analytics, what is also very important in higher education organizations. In addition to the ability of artificial intelligence systems in education, there are many advantages for students, uh, what you see in this slide, and there is also increased use of artificial intelligence systems usage in education as it helps students become more efficient learners due to the comprehensive understanding abilities which allow them to assess new knowledge quickly. So artificial intelligence is changing the landscape of education related to personalized learning, as I already mentioned. This change can be seen through personalized learning, which uses information from student data uh, to create individualized lessons and activities for students based on their needs and interests. And uh, better just for students with special needs, since artificial intelligence can be used to help special needs students because it has the ability to adapt. And uh, the third artificial intelligence has many opportunities in the field of education, once in which is immersive learning. This allows students to take more control over the learning. Furthermore, through machine learning uh, algorithms based on big data sets generated from students' interactions, online educational institutions will gain insight into each individual learner's needs, allowing teachers assistance in tailoring lessons plans specific to what different types of learners. So what is very important when we speak about personalized learning? Intelligent tutoring systems are directly related to many advantages of artificial intelligence in education. And systems can give students feedback on their work, uh, guide them towards uh, the right answer, and have been proven to be uh, more effective than traditional teaching methods alone. The most well-known benefit is uh, its ability to provide helpful feedback on student academic performance that I was mentioned about the channels, such as tests and homeworks assignments, uh, where they can receive guidance from an intelligent agent. And artificial intelligence also allow, uh, allows adaptive group formation where students can be grouped together based on their learning styles or skills so that they can learn better and more efficiently than ever before. 
Artificial intelligence can be used uh, to help students learn more uh, effectively. It does this by ass assigning each student a unique learning plan based on their progress and abilities, which means that it is possible. And for example, uh, facilitate, facilitation by example, a new study suggests that artificial intelligence will help teachers by giving students personalized lessons. So uh, artificial intelligence in education has revolutionized this by offering virtual uh, reality lessons, which is becoming more popular and popular in education. Especially we saw this and found during the pandemic period when the, especially in engineering studies, there was a big request of uh, virtual labs and uh, virtual learning objects. Uh, that allows users to learn by feeling immersed at different environmental or scenario. The advantages of artificial intelligence in education are uh, the accuracy and speed with which essay graders can grade papers. As well as artificial intelligence has the ability to assess a student's problem solving skills and offer personalized feedback based on their uh, current state and provides an innovative way to make education courses at all levels more engaging and has the ability to integrate with modern education by creating dynamic scheduling and predictive analysis for tracking students' progress. So uh, virtual humans is another point important as well, can be used to help students learn subject material more efficiently and return information better one of the most popular areas for artificial intelligence in education is intelligent game-based learning environments. So we are working on that and we are trying to get for learners the best environments for education. And machine translation is one of issues as well, is an advantage of artificial intelligence in education. This technology allows um, the invention uh, to translate text into other languages, effortlessly helping students learn different cultures and traditions worldwide. And artificial intelligence can help the differently able to learn and understand concept in a more accessible way. Uh, this would be useful when teaching students who have trouble understanding uh, the material presented at traditional speed uh, I mean the students with special needs. So uh, as mentioned before, I would like uh, to, to stop a little bit on the uh, chatbots for education. And now I will talk about that as a digital intelligence based technology that stimulates human-like conversations with users via text messages on chat according to their learning uh, content. So there are many uh, existing chatbots and frameworks identified in the different research page papers, and we can select the most suitable situation solution for that. Uh, best support is a defined uh, functionality. However, teachers can uh, apply it in the way that they prefer most of all. So um, I will try to show you a little bit of the video, which one is developed in one of our courses, uh, together with Professor Glosowskis, who is presenting the example of, of our, one of the, our uh, learning uh, object developed uh, in, in virtual reality space. So chatbots are becoming an uh, uh, ambitious trend in many fields. Uh, chatbots, the computer programs used to conduct auditory or textual conversations, you see now in the examples, uh, could be uh, effectively used, especially in large-scale learning scenarios with more than 100 students per lecture. Uh, chatbots are able to solve the problem of individual student support, what was missing very much during pandemic. We had a very nice uh, project here in Lithuania during the pandemic, the research-based project, uh, to um, analyze the situation of different technological impacts um, during the pandemic. So we found that especially for engineering 
subjects is very important to have virtual reality learning objects. Yes, the chatbots can be effective if uh, we implement pedagogical add-ons and uh, traditional intelligent tutoring systems and learning scenarios. So you see here an example how pedagogical agents uh, are human-like interfaces between the learner and the content in an educational environment. And traditional uh, intelligent tutoring system that uh, aim to provide immediate and customized uh, instruction or feedback to the learner. You see uh, how Chatbot is working here. Chatbot interacts with students in a synchronous way, making it possible to react on individual issues in virtual reality learning content. So the next example is uh, as well uh, related with um, uh, chatbots, the chatbots and learning objects, video learning object, and you can see, also I will show this out voice, uh, however chatbots and education promise to have a significant positive impact on learning success and student satisfaction, and you see in the example a chatbot as a teacher that can decrease the cognitive load of the student, which is very important, because they do not need to track large amount of content. The concept uh, chatbot as a teacher uh, enables easily to teach, to jump back or forward, to interrupt uh, the process of learning, or to have a fun during the learning. In this case, you see the communication is also in voice, uh, but giving added value and contribution to the effectiveness of, of learning processes. So uh, I will stop as an example, and if you will, will find my, my slides, you will see these full scenarios of, of the implementation. And for conclusion, we can say that artificial intelligence allows creating personalized learning plans for individual students and provide assistance to teachers to, to support teachers' process, teaching process. However, higher education organizations must balance artificial intelligence effectively with uh, GDPR uh, issues and security as well, what is uh, now very important in all higher education organizations. And that is my uh, short presentation. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Dinah. I really love the, the examples with the VR uh, and the chatbots. Uh, I will send it also to my students because I also have some students doing, uh, under my coordination, doing research about chatbots. So, so it should be useful for them. Uh, we don't have uh, yet questions in the Q&A. Please uh, feel free to ask them. I saw that in the meantime, uh, uh, Gustavo got questions in the chat and uh, he already answered them. Uh, a short uh, discussion uh, was uh, started there. Maybe you can also uh, ask your questions uh, for, for Dinah. If not, we will come back to you, uh, Dinah, uh, in the end. If uh, you uh, will still be here, I understood you also have a, a, a meeting afterwards. So thank you. I will move now to uh, the next speaker, the last speaker of today. Uh, and uh, it's uh, my uh, great pleasure to introduce my colleague from the Eden Lab Steering Committee, Igor Balaban. He is coming from Croatia. He is the Vice Dean for Science, International Cooperation and Projects, and also the Head of Laboratory for Advanced Technologies in e-learning uh, at FOI in, uh, in Zagreb. Uh, also author of many papers involved in many projects, uh, and uh, uh, I am very, I am certain his presentation is going to be uh, also very interesting. So please, Igor, we are looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to share today. Thank you, Vlad. I hope everyone can hear me and hopefully see my presentation. Vlad, can you just confirm? Yes, that yes. Is Everything is fine. Good, perfect. Thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. Although I'm the last one, I hope <laughs> it will be interesting for you as 
those presenters before me. I'm actually going to present uh, a bit of a different perspective. I'm going to uh, well, actually highlight how did we as the institution prepare for emergency online teaching and learning and what did we do, what efforts did we take in order to raise the quality of teaching and learning at our institution. Although we have had, we have had a extensive experience in e-learning, we have been dealing with the, I, I, I think that I can say that we are one of the leading institutions in e-learning in Croatia, and we have been extensively researching and dealing with the online learning for the past 25 years. Uh, maybe that was also one of our advantages. So um, we are into into the field, and we know, and we knew actually what are the obstacles of um, that immediate transition. Uh, you saw from the previous presentation. I think Gustavo has also mentioned that uh, COVID has boosted the transition, which is really uh, the truth. And at first, the students embraced the fact that they can work from home as well as the teachers because they were they felt like comfortable at but just at the first glance but later on the problems arise and uh, the problems that i think that most of the institution higher education institutions need to deal with so here i'm trying to show you i'm trying to show you what we did uh, in order to overcome some of the issues we faced and try to anticipate the problems and to help our teachers and students to, um, to have this transition as smooth as possible. First, what we did, we uh, started from the organizational perspective. Um, we developed three basic models uh, during which we actually in detail described the in-class hybrid and fully online possibilities, case studies, uh, as indicated here, actually we anticipated three different models uh, for our uh, teaching, teaching practice. So we just changed or switched the models as the situation required. Um, in order to provide the technical support, we have had installed Moodle LMS for the past 20 years, but um, besides uh, purchasing the Zoom licenses, we also did our own big blue button, which is a free and open source uh, 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 webinar uh, system. Uh, we installed that one and we scaled our um, technical support means servers and everything needed. So we have our own installation to manage smaller groups of students and Zoom licenses were used for a really large number of um, uh, students in class. We also uh, installed the AVER conferencing, which is a professional conferencing system with the uh, high resolution cameras and microphones and speakers. We installed those in a variety of our teaching rooms, lecture rooms, so the teachers were able to either provide hybrid synchronous classes, meaning one group listening at the lecture room, the other group listening at home. That system enabled that, or the teachers could just enter the empty lecture room and give their classes using that conferencing system. Next, we provided a series of support for teachers and students. I will get into the details a bit later, but for teachers, we provided a series of motivational tips and tricks on how to perform better uh, in online environment. We also prescribed how should they organize their lectures to, to be as most stimulating for students as possible. So we actually prescribed how one teaching hour of 45 minutes should look like if they are using only webinars or if they are using short videos plus other printed materials or other online materials or whatever, or how to organize their class if they are using voice over PowerPoint, other materials and short tests and quizzes. So we actually provided a template with the detailed instructions because we want we want to have a unique structure of course of all our courses in the university. Uh, the templates were also provided in the Moodle learning management system, and we also provided uh, base case examples. 
We also um, did, um, did create uh, manual and detailed instructions on possible ways of conducting online exams. That was extremely important for teachers. Um, and we also put our efforts into development and boosting the skills of the teachers. Those who are at the, I would say, initial stage of um, working with the uh, variety, uh, the, uh, different, different um, uh, learning modalities such as blended learning and fully online learning, as for those who were uh, advanced. We also provided uh, student support. Again, we provided them with the tips and tricks how, how to, let's say, behave in the online environment, how to stay motivated, focused, and central. We uh, provided a help desk for students. That was an online help desk uh, available for them every day. Help desk was actually uh, provided by the support of their own peers and some of the uh, teachers. So the students could ask for help either using online chat, uh, uh, webinar room, or they could, they could even um, get here into the building and ask for help. And we also provided uh, equipment rent for them. So for those who were not able to uh, get their own equipment um, in time, we provided equipment for them. And we also developed a, a quality control mechanism, which is actually a series of survey that help us to assess the quality of courses delivered in online teaching, in emergency online teaching, and then to do the um, <clears throat> a series of educations and activities that would help teachers uh, to raise the quality of their courses based on the feedback received. Now, in order to boost the teacher skills, we provided a series of lectures and workshops. I just wanted to pinpoint the topics we have been focusing on during the, uh, during the uh, uh, support for teachers. So we gave lectures about emergency online teaching, flipped classroom, a variety of assessment modes, plagiarism, and other issues that uh, they could face with uh, during online teaching and learning. And then we provided hands-on workshops, ABC learning design that was also, also showed, uh, showed before. We showed them how to do the courses by using program learning paths for the students, how to implement online exam. As said, we have had uh, a lot of people dealing with e-learning before, so they were able to uh, showcase uh, good examples uh, <clears throat> in a variety of that fields. Uh, in, the second, in the second round of workshops, we showed them how to, um, how to use the learning design paradigm to design the courses and how to reflect on the learning outcomes how to design problem and project-based learning course, course, how to uh, practically implement the flipped classroom, how to do with the work-based learning and laboratory-based learning. So those are just some of the topics that uh, most of them were also required by our teachers because they approach us and say, okay, we, we need this and that. But some other topics were also raised up by the uh, other um, the projects we are involved in and that are uh, dealing with the uh, emerging emerging um, issues in e-learning and emerging topics in e-learning. Um, in order to provide a transparent support for all stakeholders, we developed the FOI online portal. The FOI online portal was accessible to all of our target audience. So we have the part for teachers, for students, and the part in which we present to all community how we are doing. I will just show you very briefly uh, those three um, segments. For teachers, what we did, on the right-hand side, you see a set of uh, useful links for teachers. So we provide a detailed guidelines on how to conduct online classes, how to use Moodle system again, uh, some examples of conducting online colloquium or exams, instructions on how to record uh, their materials in a quality manner. You know, it was not a problem to record the 60 minutes material or one, hour, one hour and a half material, but the point is how to record material that those students watch afterwards. 
Then how to use big blow button, how to use Zoom tips and tricks. On the left-hand side, you see some tips and tricks we did for them. Unfortunately, those are in creation language. But you see, those are a series of cards with a very short written text, but stimulating text. Here it says, what does it mean online present versus online absent? What, uh, what does it mean for them to be uh, organized versus non-organized? How, how to be attractive online? How to be clear online? Why, why is it important to be clear online? You know. So those are some of the tips we gave them on how to perform better conducting online courses. Also, we provided some example of good practice. So we showed them some good courses that are already organized in a very good manner according to the template we have provided in the learning management system. Of course, we have provided them um, uh, technical uh, help that was needed for them as well to create the courses online, but for those teachers who required help. Then we did something similar for students. On the left-hand side, you see tips and tricks. How to maintain discipline, although all the teaching has been moved to online uh, platform. What does it mean to be on time in online environment? Why is it not good to get into the room like five minutes after, after the teacher? What does it mean for teacher? Uh, so what does it mean to be active learner? Why, why, why it's not good always to be just a passive learner? So those are the tips and tricks for students also to learn something about the good online uh, behavior, acceptable online behavior. On the right-hand side, you see a series of links provided to students. Uh, sorry. Uh, a quick guide to our faculty because you need to understand um, some generations have never seen the building because we have online exams, sorry, online enrollments in the faculty, and then the corona started, COVID started, and some uh, like 10% uh, of our total population of students have never been into the building and have never met the professors. So we needed to use some kind of a portal to uh, show them uh, how, how, how to manage um, at our faculty. How is the teaching um, at our institution organized? Uh, instructions for organizing and conducting classes for students. How will they attend classes? How, how will they um, conduct distance exams? What is required? How to test their equipment? At uh, netiquette, tips and tricks, big blue button instructions for them. So a complete set of instruction and support needed for students in order to be able to keep track um, on online um, uh, teaching was very, very important, especially for the first year of the undergraduate study, uh, because that was their first encounter with really, uh, such kind of uh, learning. And then the last phase is how we are progressing. As I've already mentioned, we created a survey that um, reflected the quality of the delivered course. So we showed the students the results, we showed the questionnaire and uh, for the subject and for a complete study program, you can see we showed transparent but uh, aggregated results uh, for two previous um, study years. Of course, the results are in creation language, but we focus on the course organization. Uh, the students could answer on a Likert type five point scale from one to five. On the right hand side, you see I totally agree with the statement and on the left hand side, I disagree with the statement. So this is about course organization, whether the course is um, uh, organized in a good manner, whether the teachers have clearly establish the rules on the course, etc. Then we focus on the quality of the course materials, whether they are organized in a good manner, whether they are um, quality and clear, whether there is a, a variety of formats such as webinar, video materials, etc. Then we focus on the assessment. How, does, how, how were the assessment made? whether the number of assessments uh, was okay or not, whether the time was uh, good for them, uh, if, um, and so on. And then the general uh, impressions, whether they were uh, interested for the subject or not, how are they satisfied, 
uh, with the online performance of the subject, and cetera. So those results are transparent and available to student community, aggregated. But we have those results per course, and we continually monitor those courses every year, and then we speak with the teachers and uh, provide uh, needed activities, conduct needed activities in order for those teachers to raise the quality of the courses. What, about, what, about, what are our future steps? Assure we use the results to improve our courses. We will pilot our vocational study program courses in blended mode. Here is the research uh, framework that we have prepared for that. We have already applied to Creation Science Foundation to have this as a research project. We also submitted Erasmus uh, Plus strategic partnership project that will help us to improve the quality of uh, teaching and learning. Uh, we, ha we have had luck. So we actually got two projects that we are coordinating. One is Teach for Edu4 and the other one is Rapide project. Teach for Edu4 project is actually, actually a strategic project where we develop learning designs of our courses and then we create a joint creative classrooms, which, which are the courses conducted with our strategic partners. So two or three strategic partner institution create one course that is conducted online, and then the students from different institutions can enroll the courses and attend the courses. We pilot those courses as, a, uh, I would say, short but intensive ones, let's say in one, in one week time. And those worth like two or three credits. And within Rapide project, we are developing work-based learning approach, work-based learning approaches, um, problem-based learning approaches, and a variety of assessments that are appropriate for this time of online learning. And the final aim is also to integrate a variety of office services into one dashboard called MyFoy, where the teachers could see their workload, their, the satisfaction of students with their classes, results from students' assessment, and central and central, and to develop the data analytics engine that will be only for management, that will give the management inputs and the recommendations on how to move forward based on the results of the surveys. And the last thing I would like to use this opportunity to uh, although I'm aware that the Eden has the annual conference in June, we are also organizing our own conference, again, with the support of Eden. It's, it's in Dubrovnik in September. We also, in cooperation with Eden, have uh, the track on education and learning analytics. The proceedings are indexed in the following bibliographic databases, such as Web of Science, Inspec, and Centra. And I think that this year we are putting a lot of effort. I saw the Josep uh, Duard um, uh, here in the list of the uh, attendees as well. We are putting a lot of effort in um, having Eden Research Workshop also host in Dubrovnik just two days before the conference event. So we will also provide the opportunity for Eden Research Workshop participants to join the conference to publish um, the papers there at a much lower rate than the regular participants. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Igor, uh, for uh, this presentation of a good practice of how you did things in, uh, in uh, your faculty in uh, the part of the University of Zagreb. And um, I think uh, this was a good uh, um, sum up of the session. We had very interesting uh, uh, presentations today for different about different topics. Uh, you have a direct question in the uh, Q a and I would ask uh, it to you, and then we can move to to have a very short and quick discussion for the last minutes with uh, all the remaining speakers. So the question, how did you provide the supervision on online exams, enabling students to cheat? Our teachers have had uh, different mechanisms for that, but we required all participants to have their webcams on and their microphones. Uh, now, depending on the course, because really we have um, a variety of courses, and variety of different ways of providing online exams. For example, uh, some students need to uh, provide a, a program, a computer program as the solution, while some need just to answer questions. So there was really a variety of answers. And um, yeah, sure, I will stop screen share.
just a minute. Okay, good, thank you. And uh, some even required uh, participants to have um, other camera looking at their back or from their back or from the um, from the opposite perspective, so they can see what the uh, what the students were doing. Uh, what was really uh, important for me is that we did a study with our own course in which we have like 300 students. And last year we did the online exam, so fully online. But this year we did it in class and there were no difference in results. Yes, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, um... Please send the, the also the that that research that study so that we can uh, we can see it because yeah, uh, yeah it's a uh, it's an interesting result. So the students uh, while while writing online exams, students need to be logged in the learning management system. We have had a safe browser environment. We respected one question per page and some other things just to ensure that the. It's very hard to uh, to do the copy of the test, and uh, plus that, as I said, the students needed to be logged in and using web cameras via Zoom or or, or Big Blue Button or other conferencing system in order to support the. Great, uh, thank you, Igor. Um, now, if um, uh, I can get help to get uh, all the speakers. Uh... Uh, highlight it together so that we can uh, uh, jointly have a small discussion. So we have a second question related to this, and it was actually strongly connected to what I wanted to ask you. Uh, Igor already answered uh, at least partially this uh, for the first question. So we have a question from Professor Kailianu. The issue of online evaluation is very important. What online assessment systems do you use to ensure the most efficient and accurate assessment possible? Uh, Diana, would you uh, start for this one, please? Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, online evaluation is, is um, depend on, I, I was just thinking, uh, what are you thinking? It's the online evaluation of uh, the pedagogy and the teaching and the student experiences, or is the assessment? I mean, because it's not very clear for me at what you are referring I think you are referring at assessment, uh, which is exams and uh, seminars and things like that. And for that, for example, what Igor described as um, uh, the method for an online exam where you have a camera looking at the students and another camera looking at the student environment where he is, was initially used in our university by some professors. And then we somehow completely discourage that. And I will explain why, for example. First is obviously GDPR. Uh, it's not fair because that's everybody can see. You know in Zoom that uh, uh, you, if you want to really so Zoom or MS Teams or a big blue button, they all WebEx, they all act the same. If you really want to be able to see everybody at the same time, then everybody sees everybody in gallery mode. You cannot have only one speaker for uh, for the rest and the rest for you. So you that can means have this that in also big blue button. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you can have this ability in big blue button. You can isolate webcams and they, they do not see each other. Okay, yeah. So for example, we are using only Zoom and Microsoft Teams in our university, and you can't there. Uh, because Big Blue Button was using a lot of our uh, power resources uh, yeah. to be able to run it. And we usually have these sort of exams where you really need to check this with very large cohorts. I mean, over 250 uh, students at once. Usually for the smaller cohort, it's not a problem because they have projects. Uh, so it's project-based exams, more or less, and they present and they are scheduled on presentations and, and it's more an oral exam than a multiple choice exam or something like that. So for me, that's the biggest question. Uh, if others and also yourself are able to see the environment of the student, I don't consider it that correct and that fair. And we have this big discussion with the Students' Union 
and uh, we completely discouraged it. And I don't recall happening it in this academic year. It was the case very early in uh, in June 2020 when we were trying to to see exactly what's the safest way. A lot of the professors moved to project-based uh, exams and to open book exam. It's a big challenge uh, as a professor not to rely on multiple choice, but to give oral presentations and by the students, obviously, and to have uh, problems which will allow them also to search online or to discuss and to give it uh, give an answer. Others were focusing on time constraints. So if you have a shorter and more limited time for the student to answer either to specific questions, if it is a multiple choice exams, or to uh, even text or essay questions, instead of one hour, you only give 25 minutes or 30 minutes, then the student doesn't really have that time to look around and to find solutions. He really needs to be able to type it directly if he wants, uh, he, if he wants to pass. So that was um, uh, the, the, the problem, which the, the solution which we done. Uh, for us, we ran almost everything. Uh, I mean, more than 90% of the exams were based on Moodle, uh, different, uh, pl different methods. Uh, Moodle has a lot of extra modules and a lot of uh, customization which you can do for even the students, peer the exams and evaluation. Um, so we use also that by multiple choice in different uh, possibilities. We use a lot of H5P, for example, for evaluation as different tools. So depends. Um, we are a large university. I don't have the data at this moment to know exactly what was used uh, for all the exams, but that's uh, everything was more or less in the closed environment of our university, which is a uh, Moodle based, plus a lot of plugins and customization. Thank you, Diana. Um, I already knew what we do in our university, but uh, it was uh, I think it was useful for the rest of the participants to to hear it. Gustavo, can you share? about the uh, online assessment, online evaluation? How do you do it? Um, <clears throat> during the pandemic times, uh, so many uh, teachers resorted to Moodle. Having the, the exam in Moodle, they tried to customize questions according, for instance, the number of the student. Okay, for instance, the registration number is equal. You make a question that involves the registration number so that you can customize the questions. And everybody had to access Moodle through Zoom. So everybody had to, uh, to have their camera on and their microphone on, okay? And the whole idea is that we squeeze time, is giving not so much time for students to answer the question. So, um, and this was as part of the uh, emergency response. So I'm not sure if um, this was uh, adopted by everybody, but it this was, adopting my, my school. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. Um, I, I saw a lot of similarities uh, with our university. Uh, we also do Moodle with Zoom and uh, we try to customize questions as much as possible. Uh, Igor, since you already answered this topic, do you want anything to add about this? Or, no, I think uh, that, okay. Uh, I saw that you also uh, added some more information in the yeah. chat about the big blue button and- yeah. Yeah, if I can point it out to Igor that he needs to retype that to everyone because it's only to us, host and panelists. Mm -hmm. Ah, good, good eye, good eye. I didn't, Sorry. I didn't catch Thank that. Thank you very much. <laughs> good. Okay. Yes. So Academic to... problems, you know. I see, I see mistakes. <laughs> to, Thank you. Thank to, you. To to conclude the, our session, I have a last question for you because we are already a little bit late. So my final question for each of you is. Thinking about the future of uh, the technical educations in this digital new environment after the pandemic times, what would you say is the main thing a technical university should focus on? So the, the one thing which the technical universities should, should focus most on now after we will exit the, hopefully, the uh, pandemic times uh, and hopefully, uh, also without in a peaceful environment without uh, war at our borders. Whoever uh, wants to, uh, let's start with Igor maybe because he didn't uh, uh, answer the last one. 
<laughs> Igor, please. <laughs> Maybe just just short. Now we saw that the lectures could be done in, in a much shorter and in much more flexible manner for students. And since we as technical universities tend to give as much more exercise and practical work to students, I think that we could somehow try to compress uh, the time the students spend physically sitting and listening and uh, listening to the lectures by replacing many of the lectures with the much better online uh, online versions and then leave the students much more space for doing their own productive work. Thank you, Igor. Um, I, I love the, that idea of creativity and uh, getting, leaving the students to have more freedom. Thank you. Gustavo, what would well, you say? I, well, you, you, what, you are, what you want to do is a kind of roadmap. What can we do next? I would divide that in three parts. Uh, a technical, a pedagogical one, and an educational or institutional one. In technical terms, you have to equip universities, okay? You have to equip institutions with the means to provide these services and the ICT, et cetera, et cetera. So you need investment, okay? In pedagogical terms, you need to adapt your courses, and that means you need to do teacher training, capacity, et cetera. So you need to have people engaged in, in, in changing the way they, they lecture, et cetera. And finally, in educational or institutional terms, you have to, to realize things like this, like assessment, um, security, cybersecurity, because if you rely so much on digital tools, then if you have a, an attacker on your university server, that can disrupt the old educational service. So you need to combine all these different stakeholders and uh, shape for the future. Okay. Thank you so much, Gustavo. Uh, I loved especially the conclusion, shape for the future. It's, uh, it, these are very nice words. Close to home, close to heart. Diana? Yes, I, I, I was also thinking that you need to have uh, different perspectives. You need to look at macro levels, so, which also involve the entire education system, especially that where it's, uh, even if you have a lot of autonomy in the higher education, you still are a state university. You are still evaluated and accredited. And I will start from there because basically one of the biggest challenges which I see at this moment, especially with all of the changes of the digital education is in the accreditation and evaluation, especially for engineers, you know, because the evaluation and the accreditation, at least what it is done at this moment in Romania by, by RACIS, which is the national agency for evaluation and accreditation, is, allow me to say, old-fashioned. They really don't look and they don't take into account digital education methods or methodology, not even project-based learning that much. And, and they try still to, to be in the 20th century, at least, if not even, even, even before that. So if you don't change the evaluation and the accreditation system, systemic change is happening slow. In fact, what you will do is like what we've done also in these two years, but also before, is that uh, uh, at, at micro, I would say micro level and meso level. So at, mm -hmm. at the level of the professors and at the level of, of the faculties, you will have changes. They will adapt and they will do the things, but not at macro level. And that means that you are still relying only on the early adapters, on those people which really want to do it. Because change can happen only if you make the full evaluation system for everybody the same, and that needs to take into account the digital, the digitalness, at least of the tools. That's one. And second, I will strongly see that you need, or at least us in technical higher education, we need to focus a bit more on how to to involve the, the external stakeholders, community, <clears throat> and also industry and so on. And examples like virtual labs and artificial intelligence or different mentorship and, and a lot of things, support and so on, needs to be fully embedded in the, in the university, in the education. And this will mean that the three actors, which is professors, students, and the employers, really need to be able not to just shape the curricula, 
but also in the delivery of, of everyday activities. And then uh, the engineers of tomorrow will really be much more closer to what they really need to do in, uh, in the job market. And uh, so the retraining of them is going to be much more shorter uh, and, and possible. And obviously the top world nowadays is micro certificate, how you enable very short training and specific courses also in traditional higher education, not only for after the graduation system. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, also very good points. I would uh, record, record uh, and transcribe all, all the things that three of you have said and sent it as a document with recommendations to all of our technical universities. Maybe um, at some point they will take them into account and also to the national agencies uh, bureaucracy is uh, uh, not helping so much uh, our jobs. So let's uh, finish uh, with uh, hope. Let's uh, um, finish with um, uh, joy in mind and peace in mind. Uh, we are building a better community all together through these types of events, through all the work uh, we are doing. And uh, I am very proud uh, to be uh, a colleague of yours uh, uh, in this webinar. Uh, I am very happy you accepted to participate. I thank all of our participants for being here. I remind you that we still have two more days, uh, tomorrow and Friday of Eden Open Education Week webinars. You can find all the information on the website. Also, don't forget that you will receive an email at the end with a digital badge and also the information for, from where you can get the presentations from all these sessions. In the end, don't forget to uh, check out the Eden annual, annual conference in Estonia in Tallinn in June, register, submit your work there, and let's hope we can meet face to face. Stay safe, everyone, and have a nice day. Goodbye.